God bless you all. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 I, it's a joy to uh, be with you, even though uh, we can't uh, uh, shake hands, uh, can't actually enjoy each other's direct presence. But what a uh, gift to be able to do this through the computer. We um, uh, we're right in the midst of a kind of plague called uh, COVID-19. And uh, as has happened in, uh, in history, often when there are times of great stress, there's also a, a strengthening, a reawakening, a, a, a deeper awareness of God's presence and God's grace. And I'm uh, praying, Vicki and I are praying that this will be uh, part of our experience, part of our memory of uh, 2020 and this COVID-19 uh, uh, plague. We need a renewal of faith anyway. Uh, we're ripe, our, our own lives are ripe for renewal of uh, God's grace, God's presence, God's empowerment, God's anointing in each of our lives. And I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity uh, in the midst of all this pain and suffering, in the midst of, of death and disappointment, in the midst of a, a now a, a intentionally a broken economy, in, in the midst of all this, to cry out to God and to recognize him as, as always the source, the source of all good things and the source of, of our, uh, our own lives, the source of our uh, gifts, our abilities, uh, the source of hope, source of, of um, faith, the source of, uh, of love. And especially this morning, I'd like us to focus on God's amazing uh, power and love that he wants to uh, pour into our lives to help us to, uh, uh, yes, understand the stresses and the disappointments and the pain and the death around us at the same time to know his presence. Uh, even maybe especially in the midst of all this uh, great need. So uh, we're also on a very special day. This is the second Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. And there's something happened, a very powerful event happened uh, about 2,000 years ago on this uh, uh, very day uh, in the upper room as uh, the apostles, including, uh, including Thomas, the apostles were uh, meeting together. And you may uh, recall the story that when Jesus appeared to the apostles in the upper room, the, the afternoon of the day he uh, conquered death, on that day, uh, there were 10 apostles and, uh, and perhaps other people too, but Thomas was missing. Perhaps he was so doubting that there was any future that he didn't even bother to be with his friends. And so, so uh, Thomas uh, then got the word that Jesus had appeared at their meeting, even though they had locked doors. Uh, uh, Jesus had this uh, miracle ability to go through uh, walls, doors, at the same time to prove that he was truly conquering a death uh, he ate some fish uh, as a proof of uh, the real power of the resurrection in Jesus. Now, uh, Jesus uses a amazing method of, of healing Thomas, of uh, restoring a relationship, even deepening, deepening a uh, big way, uh, Thomas's relationship uh, with God. Uh, Jesus used a, a three-step method that he also used with another leader in uh, the next chapter of John. But in the text that we're um, uh, looking at uh, first is uh, John 20, and you may want to uh, uh, follow along as I read about uh, what happened. John 20, uh, starting at verse 24. Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, uh, was not with them when Jesus came on that. Uh, um, resurrection uh, Sunday afternoon. And the other uh, disciples, therefore, were saying to him, uh, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, you know, unless I shall see his hands 
and, and the imprint uh, of the nails and put my finger into the place uh, of the nails and put my hand into the side, you know, where Jesus was, was cut open, then uh, I will not believe. So Thomas is a, a dogmatic doubter, uh, just uh, rejecting the very idea that Jesus could have uh, conquered death. Um, and uh, after eight days, uh, disciples again were inside in the upper room, and Thomas was with them, and Jesus came again. And the doors having been shut, and uh, uh, they stood, he stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then immediately he said to Thomas in verse 27, uh, Reach out your, your finger and touch my hands, and reach out your hand and put it into my side, and be not unbelieving but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Uh, Thomas was immediately uh, brought back into a relationship with Jesus, immediately brought back into a, a vibrant trust in Jesus. And you just think of those four words, my Lord and my God. Um, two of those four words were the word my. He made it very personal acknowledging uh, Jesus as the Lord, uh, a word used uh, primarily for, uh, for God in the Hebrew scriptures, the scriptures uh, of the time, and uh, the, the, what we call the Old Testament. And calling him his Lord and his God was a profound confession of faith and uh, showing Thomas uh, really understood that, um, that the uh, amazing uh, work of God, the amazing power of God, the one that created all the universes, that this amazing power was demonstrated in Jesus and was empowering the grace of God in Jesus to uh, draw him back. Now, what are, the, uh, what are the three steps that I'm uh, referencing that, that, that Jesus exemplifies in this story? and in other stories, and we can see it as a pattern for Jesus' ministry. We can see it as a pattern of God's work in our own lives, even. And also, I would recommend it as a pattern as we relate to other people. And that is to confront, to defer, and to emancipate. Confront, defer, and emancipate. First of all, Jesus confronted. Jesus didn't wait for uh, uh, Thomas to uh, come up with his questions uh, or to uh, you know, state his doubts. Uh, Jesus already knew what Thomas was uh, struggling with, his own uh, deep doubt of real supernatural grace, real supernatural power. And, and so Jesus uh, confronts him, uh, first of all, uh, by uh, approaching him you know, without judgment. You know, I'm, uh, I believe that uh, uh, it would have been easy, we could even expect if someone else were writing the story, if they were just making up the story, would say that Jesus judged him, said, you know, how dare you? You saw a thousand miracles. You even saw me raise the dead. You saw me raise Lazarus. You saw me raise Jairus' daughter. You saw me raise uh, the widow's son. Um, you know, why, why would you doubt that God has authority over life and death? But none of that, no judgment, no rejection, no labeling of Thomas. Uh, but the first thing Jesus does when he comes into the room is he goes to Thomas and in a way confronts him, but lovingly confronts him, forgivingly confronts him, gently confronts him, but confronts him nevertheless. Jesus initiates this encounter and then he deferred you know he he related he did not um, uh, uh, have he was not shaping this by his own character only but totally at the same time it surely it was totally Jesus doing this but he was totally relating to Thomas as well he was deferring to Thomas's framework to Thomas's hunger for, for help, Thomas's need to have his uh, uh, doubts answered, to really take that step into the new humanity, to take that step 
into uh, uh, embracing fully the grace of God in Jesus. And, and notice that uh, when Jesus came, he uh, did another miracle. He went through the closed door. He was uh, demonstrating his miracle power also right on the spot, not, uh, not really drawing attention to that fact, but it was pretty obvious to Thomas that uh, Jesus' amazing powers were still uh, very much part of his presence. And then uh, he offered the raw data that Thomas had said he needed. Uh, and, and, you know, he didn't say, hey, Thomas, you've been saying all these uh, negative things that you have to actually touch. You have to actually feel uh, the nail prints and the, and the uh, sword cut. No, uh, it's still deferring to Thomas, still respecting Thomas. Uh, Jesus immediately provides the, the data that Thomas was uh, asking for. And what is a great theme of scripture is that uh, we don't have blind faith. Uh, the Bible never uh, advocates blind faith. In fact, the, the word, uh, primary word for faith in the Hebrew scriptures is amen and variations on that word. But uh, with the core, uh, uh, you know, radical, uh, what is called the radical, the core word in the a word for um, faith is amen. And it's also is the core a word for truth. <clears throat> and of course, these two concepts go together even in English. We trust someone to tell the truth. Um, and the very uh, act of trust is to believe that person will represent the truth. Uh, so what we've separated as two words really can be understood as two sides of one concept. If someone is trustworthy, they will speak the truth. If we know they regularly or always speak the truth, we trust them. So trust and truth are, are really uh, uh, closely related in our own experience. Also, um, you know, I think of, um, uh, you know, think of, for example, the first time faith is mentioned in the Bible is with Abraham. Uh, it says Abraham believed God. And you could, you could translate that Abraham trusted God and that was counted as right relationship. Or you could say Abraham truth to God, discerned that God was the God of truth. And of course, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Truth is a, a great, awesome, precious character of God. So nevertheless, uh, uh, Jesus wasn't asking uh, Thomas to have blind faith, was giving him data. And in fact, the scriptures are, are loaded with uh, data for us to really understand more and more who God is and why we can trust him. And the whole point of testimony too, to give each other data, to share experiences that we have in God, to really build each other's faith, representing how God is part of my life and your life and being able to go forward in God because we trust the, uh, the record of God's grace in each of our lives, we can bear testimony. So I encourage you to share testimonies and even to keep track of uh, uh, deep experiences you've had with God, simple answers to prayer, or deep uh, uh, life-changing answers to prayer are a very powerful way to build, to build our faith. Now, we uh, have uh, uh, then this amazing step of confronting Thomas, deferring to Thomas, relating to what Thomas said he needed Jesus to provide, and providing all of it. And then he emancipated uh, Thomas. He, he uh, freed Thomas to express himself. And Thomas says this amazing, amazing confession of faith, a basic Christian confession called Jesus his Lord and his God. Now, early on in, in uh, Christian history, the, the simple statement, Jesus Christ is Lord, Thomas's confession, 
facing Jesus, calling him, you know, my Lord and my God. Uh, this is the most, probably the most elemental Christian statement that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, Paul says in Romans 10, whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord and believes in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, you know, Thomas did at this point too, uh, he is saved. And in other places, this sort of a line uh, appears uh, very dramatically in uh, Philippians chapter 2, where uh, Paul describes the amazing gift of uh, Jesus life his humility his obedience unto death and therefore it says uh you know god has raised him to these highest levels that the name of jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord notice again these are also thomas's words saying to jesus christ uh, you are my lord and my god so um, an amazing accomplishment. He's now free, and uh, Thomas uh, became a, a loyal representative of Jesus. Um, commonly believed that he went to India and uh, brought many people to know Jesus and was a martyr for the faith. He uh, so deeply committed himself that even the threat of death did not stop him from sharing the gospel uh, with uh, strangers and with friends so uh he's definitely an exemplary person brought to jesus through this amazing steps of grace these c d e confront defer and empower i was looking for abc but but c d e is pretty good too uh through three consecutive uh letters in the english alphabet uh, so think of, uh, instead of CDC uh, in, uh, you know, Centers for Disease Control, cdc.gov, here we have cde.god. That is, God's method is to confront lovingly, to defer, to speak to us where we are at lovingly, and to emancipate, to really free us, to uh, be all that he created us to be, be all that he has redeemed us to be, uh, to be emancipated, to be freely celebrating and living for and uh, uh, spreading the good news, uh, teaching and ex exemplifying his grace. Well, I was another one of the apostles that was there at the time, but doesn't play a big role in that story there a week after uh, Resurrection Sunday. And, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, this man is, is troubled because he uh, denied Jesus three times. And definitely a, a person that uh, we would know Jesus would want to reach out to and, and uh, bring his grace, bring his affirmation to, to restore uh, this man rather than have him burdened uh, by guilt. I find it stunning personally. When you think of all that uh, Peter had heard Jesus say, seen him do, uh, and that he never, according to any uh, record of the four gospels, there's never a reference to Peter saying to Jesus, I'm sorry, I really messed up that Thursday night. I, I, can't, I can't excuse myself. I was awful. I, I didn't really trust your power. I didn't really trust your ability to protect me. And, and I denied you, right? Even while you were watching, I denied you three times. I can't even ask for forgiveness. Or maybe I asked for forgiveness because I know of, of your love and, and your own amazing teaching about forgiveness. But no word, not a word. Peter uh, is just trying to move on and and yet uh, carry this awful memory of his own uh great stumble there thursday evening as jesus was going through his uh, first of uh several unjust uh, trials and uh and the one of the gospels uh even does say that that jesus saw looked at him when he had uh, denied him a third time 
So, uh, so how does Jesus uh, heal this man? How does Jesus uh, fix this problem so that Peter is not dragged down the rest of his life? And uh, guess what? Again, Jesus uses the three steps, confront, defer, and empower. Now, just to show how similar these stories are, although very different kinds of people, Thomas and Peter, just very different, very, very different types of people, uh, different kinds of, of problems that they had. But in some sense, there was both a case of doubt. Um, Thomas, more obvious, you know, I won't believe until I actually touch, see and touch. Uh, where Jesus' uh, sores were uh, from the nails, the nail prints in his wrist or, or hands, and the, and the uh, sword uh, scar, the huge sword scar in his side. So Thomas is more upfront, uh, perhaps, in a way. But, uh, but Peter was doubting, not a doubter, too. You can say the denying Peter, but, but he was a doubter. Um, he was, uh, you know, doubting obviously, doubting that Jesus would have the power of protecting him if he admitted that he had a relationship with Jesus. When I've, you know, we've talked about this story, many people have said, but hey, for the Romans, one more cross, one more death, not a big deal. Uh, they would have uh, 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 drawn up Peter and have him crucified right with Jesus. Well, maybe, maybe. I don't think so. Uh, I think Jesus in the same way that he had the power to restore the soldier's ear when he was arrested, Jesus would have a, a, a way of protecting if, if he was faithful, but nevertheless, Peter uh, messed up. And then, as, as you may know, uh, when uh, women came from the empty tomb and talked about the angels and what the angels had said to them, uh, suggesting that something miraculous is going on, the Bible text says in uh, Luke 24, 11, that Peter thought this was all nonsense, just nonsense. Not even unbelievable, but just total nonsense. I mean, that's about as negative as you could be about anyone's uh, testimony of what they've heard and seen. It's just nonsense. And, and then when uh, Peter is urged to go and he, goes to the tomb and sees that it's empty, then he leaves. Uh, it's, it's in fact only Mary Magdalene that hangs around, uh, just determined to find out what happened with Jesus' body. Uh, but uh, so Peter is really a doubting uh, Peter, as there is also the doubting Thomas. So uh, we need to uh, uh, fix this in some way and uh, uh, Jesus certainly uh, knew how to do it. So the story, uh, actually the gospel story, seems to be wrapped up at the very end of chapter uh, 20 uh, with a wonderful summary uh, that these things have been written, this gospel has been written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you have life in his name. What a wonderful conclusion. But then there is one more chapter. And I think it's very dramatic of uh, the a writer, Apostle John, who, who wrote the gospel according to John, to really sense how there's still one more thing. And of course, there is still in 2020, a lot of one more things in terms of the story of Jesus' uh, leadership and power among those that uh, follow him, that are devoted to him. So the next chapter starts with uh, Peter uh, saying to a, a group of men, including I think six other of the others of the apostles, uh, uh, Peter says, uh, "I'm going to go fishing." Now remember, Peter is supposed to be a leader, but he's not leading. He's he's so broken, he's so disoriented. Yet um, now we don't know how many weeks after Jesus' resurrection, uh, he's seen Jesus twice. And, and instead of saying, hey guys, let's organize a little fishing trip, he simply says, I'm going fishing. And, um, and uh, six others say, hey, we'll come along. Uh, so that's something really organized by uh, Peter. But when they go out, they don't catch any fish. Kind of sounds familiar. You may remember that 
the very day Jesus called Peter, started with Peter uh, coming in with his colleagues, uh, his brother and uh, Andrew and uh, James and John, uh, came in to the shore of uh, Lake uh, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and uh, had no fish at all, even though they had, they had fished all night. In that case, as you may remember, Peter's uh, sitting at a distance on the shore, uh, mending his nets, pretending not to listen to Jesus, or maybe not even listening to Jesus. Jesus gets an idea. He wants to catch uh, Peter's attention. So he uh, says, hey, Peter, let me uh, stand in your boat or sit in your boat so I can see the people uh, better. And uh, you know, we could go out just a, a few feet and, and I can teach better. So Peter goes along with it. But since it's his boat, he's kind of possessive. He's, he says, I have to sit next to you. So he sits right next to Jesus while Jesus teaches. One powerful, one very smart way of Jesus getting Peter's attention, wouldn't you think? And then when Jesus was done teaching, Jesus said, hey, let's go out. Let's go out into the uh, Sea of Galilee. Let's catch some fish. Peter says, no way. You know, uh, we failed last night. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's, you know, we, we just utterly failed. Not even one fish. But then Peter adds, uh, because you asked, I'll do it. So he's already being converted by Jesus. He's recognizing Jesus as as an awesome teacher. And they go out and they catch so many fish that other boats have to come out to help uh, bring the nets in. And, and Peter's all the more convinced of the amazing, special uh, nature of Jesus. And when then Jesus says, look, follow me, and I will make you fishermen. So that was Simon, who Jesus later uh, named Peter. Uh, and now uh, Jesus is standing on the shore. Uh, the boat is, it, the Bible says, uh, uh, 200 uh, cubits out into uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee. A cubit is the distance between a man's elbow and the tip of his middle finger on average. You know, two people are exactly the same. It's about 18 inches. So 200 cubits is 300 feet or approximately 100 yards. And so the, the full length of a football field. Um, and so Jesus can't see really uh, just with normal sight, uh, uh, you know, whether they caught fish or not. So, uh, but nevertheless, Jesus shouts out to them, uh, you know, uh, young men, do you uh, have any fish? And they said, no. And Jesus says, uh, drop your net on the right side. See what you can get. And sure enough, 153 large fish swim right into the net and definitely caught these men's attention. And uh, they're stunned and look. And then, uh, uh, you know, Peter's trying to figure out who this is. They're so far away, they don't see a, a clear facial expression. And um, John says, hey, Peter, that's Jesus. So Peter uh, jumps in to swim. Again, notice he's not a leader at this point. He just jumps in by himself to uh, get to the shore to, to greet Jesus. He's eager to talk with Jesus. Maybe he wants to bring up the denial business again, which he hasn't ever brought up since that night he did it. And the, the men, uh, the other men, bring the boat in, bring the, uh, uh, and then you know, Peter helps them bring the, the uh, fish in. And they count as 153 large fish, uh, which is a huge, huge catch. I don't think there's anything symbolic about 153. But the point is, it's a, uh, a, a large, to really be dramatic, uh, the truth, the dramatic truth is a large catch. So then um, Jesus has already uh, cooked breakfast for them. He had fish and bread. And Jesus serves these men, serves these seven apostles. Uh, the amazing uh, quality of Jesus to always be eager to serve. The servant leader. Um, if there's a, a entry in a dictionary for servant leader, they definitely should have Jesus' picture uh, there as the prime example of servant leader. Remember how 
even that Thursday night before he was arrested, uh, he had washed every one of the apostles' feet, including even Judas's and Peter's and Thomas's. So uh, Jesus has uh, uh, fixed breakfast. He serves each man. Just what a wonderful sight that is. The Lord and master of all the universes is offering the best breakfast to these men. And then uh, Jesus strikes up a conversation with um, uh, Peter. And, and you've probably studied this before or heard about it, but in this case, uh, uh, Jesus, in the, in the Bible text, the usual uh, uh, Bible uh, text, has uh, Jesus asking three times uh, to Peter, do you love me? Slight variations on each one. And then Peter saying, you know, I do love you. You know I do. And most Bible texts don't differentiate between two different kinds of love that appear in this dialogue. And this is important at, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, all love is good. And agape love is like the ultimate love, committed love, come what may kind of love, um, modeled particularly in marriage, uh, where we have the vow in sickness and in health, uh, for better, for worse, uh, to love and, and to cherish, um, for richer, for poorer, uh, a, a deep commitment to love, a covenantal love, in the Greek words, uh, is agape. And a very fine kind of love is phileo, um, which is uh, love uh, between deep friends. Um, a, a way of describing it is if I said I phileo you, I would say I am fond of you. I like being around you, which is a far cry from uh, complete devotion. And so uh, when Jesus asks the first question, he says, uh, Peter, do you love me more than these? And just to stop for a minute there, remember Jesus' intention here is to heal Peter, to, to save Peter, to express his amazing grace to Peter. And so he's starting the conversation with a confrontation. He's asking Peter, do you love me? Agape love, are you really devoted to me more than these? And people have debated uh, ever since, what does Jesus mean by more than these? Maybe Jesus is saying to Peter, do you love me more than you love these men, these other men? Or maybe he's saying, do you love me more uh, than these other men love me? Are you the most loving person here? Or maybe uh, do you love me more than these? referencing the pile of 153 large fish still uh, uh, jumping up and down on the shore. Uh, well, we don't know. And I would guess, honestly, that Jesus probably meant all three of them. Why don't you know if uh, Peter really had this covenantal love, this deep, sacrificial, committed, come what may kind of love, more than any of the other men? had for Jesus, or more than he had in love and, and appreciation of the other man, or even for the profession of fishing, which had been Peter's uh, profession. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Peter answers, not using agape. Uh, Peter answers uh, saying, you know, I, I love you. I'm, I, I love you, but using phileo love for saying, therefore, I am fond of you. I appreciate you. I hold you, hold you in high regard. So in a way that uh, uh, Peter is, is honest, thank God, uh, he's probably still burdened uh, by that guilt, not knowing how to bring it up. Uh, Peter does not respond to the comparison, you know, more than these. Peter just simply says, you know, I'm, I love you, meaning I am fond of you. Uh, so uh, Jesus uh, proceeds to, to say to Peter, uh, you know, therefore, um, take care of my sheep. And then uh, Jesus, uh, take care of my lambs, rather, Jesus says. 
And then Jesus uh, asked him a similar question. Uh, you know, Simon, again, not using Peter, going back to the original relationship before Jesus had ne renamed him Peter. Uh, Simon, uh, do you love me? Do you agape me? Are you sacrificially committed in love to me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I am fond of you. You know that I flow you. So not using the same word, very intentionally. Very intentionally, obviously. Uh, and uh, Jesus responds, then take care of my sheep. And, and notice too, to take care of the sheep, to take care of the lambs, uh, to feed my sheep. Uh, these phrases refer to the Peter as the pastor, meaning shepherd. So one of the reasons we use that term pastor as in uh, Pastor Peter, Pastor Andrew, uh, Pastor Paul, uh, is because our role representing Jesus is, is to be good shepherds as well. Nevertheless, to go on to then verse 17, a third time Jesus asked, Simon, son of God, do you love me? But this time, and this is so amazing, so utterly Jesus style, so powerful model of deferring to Peter. The third time Jesus uses the word that Peter has just used twice. Jesus says to Peter, are you fond of me? And then it's almost as if Peter misses the point that Jesus had deferred to him. Jesus shifted the language of his questions to being fond of, to have this weaker sense of love, this weaker kind of commitment. But, but nevertheless, Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him the question the third time. Peter is still obviously thinking about denying Jesus three times. And he's hurt, he says, the text says, because Jesus asked him the third time, rather than being overjoyed that Jesus had deferred to Peter's own use of the word love, being fond of Jesus. So he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I'm fond of you. Uh, then Jesus said, uh, feed my sheep. Now, let me read the text then literally so you get the full measure of the shift that Jesus makes to defer to Peter. Remember, Jesus lovingly confronted him with the issue. Peter had never brought it up, never confessed his sin, never said he was sorry. But Peter uh, uh, needs a redemption, needs to be free of this needs liberation, needs to be uh, emancipated. And so Jesus says, uh, and I'm reading then uh, from a literal uh, translation. Uh, after breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know that I am fond of you. Then feed my lamb. Jesus told him. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know, I am fond of you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, are you fond of me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him the question the third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I'm fond of you. Jesus then said, feed my sheep. Now, Jesus is meeting Peter where he was at. We know that Peter uh, grew in his commitment to Jesus. He had such amazing courage at Pentecost and in other uh, parts of his ministry reported in the book of Acts and uh, demonstrated in the two letters, First Peter and Second Peter. Um, and we know from history, too. But uh, even right here in this situation, Jesus tells Peter that he will be crucified, that, that his arms will be stretched out, uh, be brought to a place that he doesn't want to go. Um, and people understood that to mean that someday, uh, Peter would be crucified. Now, his crucifixion happened 
more than 30 years after this, uh, Peter was uh, a faithful servant, faithful evangelist, faithful, rep faithful representative of Jesus. But don't, isn't this amazing how Jesus uses the same amazing pattern, the C-D-E, to confront, to initiate the conversation. Jesus, in his own teaching, had said in Sermon on the Mount, if, if um, you, know, you are uh, responsible, if you are, uh, have hurt somebody, uh, prepare you know, just to fix it, and then come back to our worship. Don't, don't just uh, uh, continue, try to continue and pretend it didn't happen. And, and then Jesus uh, also taught uh, that if someone has offended you, has hurt you, has uh, done some harm to you, go to that person. Uh, to uh, uh, try to uh, set things right. So whether you're the, the victim or the uh, offender, Jesus taught to go to that person. So confronting is always a good idea, but obviously lovingly confront, then lovingly defer. Peter needed Jesus to come to his level. Jesus knew that Peter would grow to be uh, a lion of God, a real powerful, um, courageous representative of the gospel. But Jesus, Jesus, in his love and his grace, went right to where Peter was. And then uh, Jesus liberates him, emancipates Peter, uh, even telling him just a minute later that, that he would be crucified for his faith. Uh, which is, in its own way, probably emancipating, that Peter would know uh, that Jesus trusted him to have the courage to go forward in his ministry, knowing that there would be a, a painful point, and probably doubtless many painful points. So uh, remember these uh, steps, I think for two reasons. One is, when we messed up, when we've offended God, when we've not followed his guidance from the Bible or from the Holy Spirit, um, to really trust that in God's amazing grace, he, he will come to us. And, and when we feel that sense of conscience or uh, regret, to really go to him, to get as soon as possible, get to a place where we can be on our knees, uh, where we can focus our hearts and minds to, to be honest with God and to hear his words of forgiveness and love and, and uh, compassion. And, and recognize that, that God is willing, eager. Uh, it's his habit to come to where we are, to defer to us and to liberate us. We don't have to constantly uh, carry the burden of guilt, but instead to be liberated by the blood of Jesus, be liberated by the grace of God, an amazing gift, an amazing, amazing gift. And uh, secondly, it helps us in ministry too, to not uh, think about, well, people got to come to the church or people have to do this or that uh, before we give them any attention. No, the, the, the Great Commission starts with the word go, go to people, uh, confront, lovingly confront, positively confront, uh, joyfully confront them with the amazing grace of God and defer, speak on their level, speak in a way that relates to their lives and emancipate, free them, not to be just like you, but no, to be all that God created and redeem them to be, to liberate people as we are liberated by God's grace as well. So let this be a, a pattern for our own relationship with God as he drew Thomas and Peter into uh, a deep relationship with him. Uh, Jesus does the same for you and me. If you don't know him, if there are barriers now, let him confront you. Be on your knees, invite him to confront you. Invite him to defer to where you're at, though you want to be lifted up, you want to be drawn forward yeah, into his uh, amazing embrace, um, into his amazing grace. And then to be liberated, to really 
not carry that burden, to really give it, give it away, give it to Jesus. Uh, uh, listen to what he has to say about freeing us and then become all that God has created you and redeemed you to be. So let that be our own testimony and a model of ministry, C-D-E. Confront, defer, and emancipate. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Great God, we just thank you. We cannot thank you enough. Absolutely cannot thank you enough for your amazing gift of grace, for your amazing uh, method of drawing us to you, where you lovingly come to us. And, and we can invite you to, to really be honest because we've perhaps been pushing you off. Lord Jesus, we invite you to confront us with the issues we need to deal with with you. And, and to receive your deferring words, to your relating to where we are and what issues we have and what opportunities we have in, in the challenges of our own lives and the additional challenges of the COVID-19 plague uh, to that you have a message for each of us, that you will defer to where we are at because you understand it perfectly and help us to receive that deferential treatment of your grace. And Lord, liberate us, emancipate us uh, in this time of great suffering, great challenge, uh, physical, economical, many other ways, personal. May, may we really receive your emancipation uh, to be liberated, to uh, as, as uh, Paul says in Galatians 5, to stand in the liberty for which you liberated us. And may we receive that liberty to really totally become all that you made us and redeemed us to be by your awesome grace. Hallelujah. Amen.